Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And yeah, I can actually briefly talk slightly more about Finland uh, now that you introduced this topic of game development. As Housemark, the company that I do represent, we're the oldest uh, existing game developer in Finland, uh, founded in uh, 1995. Uh, previously, we did do, uh, as two companies, uh, Terramark and Bloodhouse, uh, two games for the Amiga. Anybody remember the Amiga system? No? Yeah, okay, here we go. Uh, so that was uh, about 25 years ago almost. And, um, and Remedy, if you know of Max Payne and, and Control uh, credits uh, recently, they are two months younger than us, so we give them shit a lot of the time for being the young guys. Uh, on the scene. But after that, um, the, the Finnish game industry did start growing a bit and the mobile uh, scene had a big impact on it. Um, again, something that I'm not that familiar with. As, as mostly I've been focusing on PC and console games. Uh, but Rovio with Angry Birds had a huge impact on international uh, publishers and, and people being interested in Finland. And then uh, this small company called Supercell at some point came out. I remember actually Supercell used to actually be quite small and, and I was giving them shit at these drinking events because and, and their games were shit. Uh, but then, you know, they did something and it worked out. So really glad that it did. But uh, you never know really what's going to happen and there's something in the water over there uh, that's hard to explain. Uh, but hopefully I can open up a little bit of that here and, and maybe even in some questions afterwards. But um, what I'd like to talk to you about today is something quite personal and, and I get very emotional when I talk about this, uh, so bear with me. Uh, but this is, um, I, I want to bring you a story of what we did with a small group of individuals where we really put our hearts into a title, maybe too much. Uh, even and and um, the lesson of the story is how do you foster innovation uh, like Philip was talking about but my take on it is more the actual relationships you form um, how you spend time with people uh, how you interact with your your peers and and uh, what you can learn from those things so it's very through examples that I'll, I'll, I'll tell you my story. It might not be the same for everybody, but hopefully you can at least relate to some of it. So production mythologies and how they excel on trust. Sounds complicated. It's basically just how do you do trust at work uh, when you work on games. So the vices of the workplace. Uh, everybody has a good work-life balance, right? You all do eight hours at work and then you go home and you have a relaxing evening. Uh, but there's, imagine that if you workplace, you might have a beer sometimes. You might stay uh, later at a bar. Well, those are the vices, the bad things, the not really formal work things that you may do. Well, my idea is that maybe you can learn from them and you can expand on the real experience because your work friends are your work friends, but then if you want to become better friends with them, you do, you do need to kind of take it out of the workplace. So balancing, balancing your work-life relationships uh, really uh, change uh, if, you, if you do some things a bit more, uh, and they can help you foster the innovation, uh, communicate, and actually accept feedback. These are always the things that you have at these lectures, it's like you need to communicate better, you need to take feedback better. Uh, but in reality, how does that work? Well, if you don't know the people or you just relate to them as your business counterparts, the people you meet at work meetings, there's no real reason to develop genuine real relationships. But you have this sort of a superficial uh, relationship. Uh, so my point is uh, you need to become better friends. It can still be business but you need to be able to understand them on a more personal level. And when you can resonate with people, then you can start building trust. And then you can start actually having proper communication and understanding people. But if you, if you don't know them or trust them, then the communication is not as effective. Uh, the example I'm going to give you 
is going to be in a, a video format. Uh, without pressing play yet, uh, I hope there is a play video to press somewhere. Uh, I'll introduce you to it. So we uh, at Housemark are known for making arcade type of games, smaller games uh, like Resogun. Uh, and this is actually a story. We made a movie. Uh, about the making of the game that came after Resogun called Next Machina. Basically, Resogun is based off of an old classic arcade title called Defender, made in the 1980s by a man named Eugene Jarvis from, from uh, Chicago. And uh, we met him and we're like, we're fans, let's do a game together. And he's like, who the fuck are you? And, uh, but then he went home and played Resogun and he actually liked it and called us back. And we started developing a game concept off another game he did called Robotron. And Robotron was the first twin stick shooter of all time, uh, which kind of resonated with us. So we wanted to make a new uh, version of this. So basically, we start making a game. Uh, and then comes the big uh, question. What do we call it? Uh, I don't know how you guys usually decide on a name. Maybe it comes right off the top. Maybe you change it last minute before you put it on Steam or something. But uh, we had this crazy idea of, of doing an experiment on how to name games. Uh, the experiment was somebody heard this from somewhere. It's called the Russian Submarine Experiment. It sounds weird. But basically, you go into a hotel room, you cardboard all the windows, uh, you bring in lots of alcohol, and you don't leave uh, until you have the name. And the cardboard is there, so you don't know what time of day it's outside. So it doesn't affect the way you think about having to be somewhere or do something. It usually takes a weekend. We tried to do this in one day. So uh, if you can, uh, please play the video. Let's see uh, how it goes. To the name, can I now introduce the rules of the evening? This is a variation of the submarine party, uh, also known as uh, Russian Weekend. The intention of tonight is, of course, to come up with a name for our project, codenamed Resotron, codenamed Jarvis Project. And the way we do it is that we don't stop drinking until we get the name. The only rule that we have is that every half an hour, everybody has to drink a shot. The whole thing ends when we can agree that this is the final name to the game. OK, so we have like 300 names. Adam Viper. Eugenius Jarvius. The Adventures of Thelma Robotson. <laughs> Timer done. I'm pretty sure we have the right name already. But we yeah. have the right direction, at least. There you go. Uh, I can tell you that we, uh, we got some names. N -n not the one we ended up going with, but uh, yeah. Uh, as an experiment, we still learned something from it. We became better friends with our coworkers through this experience. And uh, it hasn't become a tradition yet. It was quite painful. Uh, but uh, some of these things can be then, you know, becoming part of your culture, part of your uh, tradition. And uh, it can really open you up to thinking a bit outside of the box of how to approach uh, different problems you may have at your company. Uh, and honestly, sometimes it's just good to get out of the office, you know? Because you're always thinking a certain way when you're in that confines of your office, or if you're, even if you're working from home, uh, you might have to go outside just to get a little fresh perspective every now and then. But uh, one thing we really learned is that uh, uh, the people you saw here in the video, uh, there were two guys especially that were really good colleagues of mine. And uh, during the usually years that it takes to develop a game, uh, you, you get to learn a little bit more about them. And this was sort of the crash course into at least getting things out in the public and getting us talking about uh, our things. And alcohol is not the right solution for everybody. But uh, for us, at least the three of us, um, uh, it worked quite well. We later did get some, some comments from our other coworkers saying, this is not the right representation of everybody in this company. But, you know, to, to, to us three, uh, and that's what we're telling the story of a few individuals, 
uh, that you can take in this example, uh, maybe to try with some friends who are open to these experiences. Um, yeah, so again, try, try different things, uh, kind of get out of your comfort zone uh, and, and really see how you can get uh, to trusting people and, and opening up to people uh, and what works for, for what kind of uh, people you have uh, in your company. So, next we of course get to the part that you've established things, you've opened up uh, your inhibitions and you start sharing the process. Um, I don't know how, uh, there's a lot of different ways of, for example, pitching a game who's been talked about a lot today. Uh, if it's just one person that creates that pitch or if it's everybody in the company that comes together with all ideas and then you just have like a design by democracy or uh, each individual has their own expertise that you can bring in uh, to creating an idea. But uh, at Housemark, uh, we basically have this uh, thing that we call uh, pitch days or pitch weeks, uh, where everybody from our company, that's, uh, I think currently it's uh, growing, so it's up to 80 people now, um, you get to make a pitch and present it in front of the whole company, and then if, if people like it, if they resonate with it, uh, we have a pitch committee, which I'm leading, uh, and then we take those to certain steps, uh, we create some more materials, we create maybe concept art, and we work with the individuals and maybe they form groups of people who like those pitches. Um, and during these pitch weeks and pitch days, we give them a certain amount of hours or days um, to work on these materials as well. So usually we have these uh, hopefully once a year uh, at least. But our approach uh, is sharing the process and uh, really getting everybody involved. Uh, and uh, again, it's something where you can find some new aspects of different people that you work with that maybe you didn't know from the day-to-day -day, uh, operations. And uh, it gives everybody sort of uh, an idea of ownership. Because when you're working on a title, especially when it's a big project and you know, you're doing a small part, maybe you don't feel like it's your game. Uh, so, having that voice, even if you don't make a pitch, even if you don't take part of it, you know you have the opportunity to do that, and I think that is a really key ingredient in sort of creating a culture of ownership um, around your projects. So, pitching openly uh, is, is a big thing. Um, uh, again, since we have video footage, I'd like to give you a little snippet of not one of our pitch days or weeks, but continuing in the vein of going outside of the office uh, to events. This is another event um, closely tied into a Finnish cultural um, phenomenon called the sauna. And have you heard about that? Right? It's a hot broom that you go for no reason. And then you have pain and alcohol. Uh, we brought our friend Mr. Eugene Jarvis to Finland and of course we wanted to have a proper meeting in a proper place with a, a, a hot pain room. Uh, but yes, roll the, roll the clip please. So, so far we have man versus machine, human slugs. I pitch you one idea that the guys don't like, but yeah. I want to pitch yeah. it to you. Okay. Everyone starts walking away. Yeah. <laughs> Many years later, this protagonist is grown up, and what he finds out is that in this new world, his uh, childhood friend, uh, now enemy, has become some kind of king. A revenge? Yeah, so it is a revenge, but it's kind of for petty reasons, for petty right. childhood reasons. Okay. I'm actually struggling. I didn't hear it now, but I, I think it's the same shit that we heard before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Tomas, 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 with much love. I'm starting to like your story because... Oh, I start to grow on them, that's why I keep pitching it. Yeah. <laughs> this is like the fifth time you've told me this today, man. It's like, fuck it, let's do it, man. Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> After this, if you still want to make a game with us, <laughs> then we're on to something. <laughs> yes, we have uh, nudity in the movie, so it's rated R. Uh, but uh, enough of that. Uh, yeah, so I mean, again, this is an example where Tommaso, our uh, Italian friend, our uh, 
he was actually the community manager at House Mark at that time. Uh, he had a very strong idea he was passionate about and, and uh, multiple times uh, had the chance to express this idea. He actually did it in a pitch room, you know, meeting room. Uh, and then this was uh, the fifth time or something he talked about it. So we'd gotten friendly enough that I could call it shit because I already given him that feedback in a more proper a formal setting, and then in this informal setting, it was sort of something we laughed about, but uh, it didn't end up being the key thing, but again, you know, him being able to express that, uh, let us know that he has these ideas, uh, you know, and let us know what he thinks is key to the game and so on. So I think it's really important to at least be able to voice your opinions and not feel like you live in a dictatorship uh, and that really takes a lot of the tension off and then lets you sort of be in a creative environment uh, where you never really know what's going to come up. And when you do see that creative idea that does work, you need to be able to then give the feedback that, hey, let's think about this. Let's have another shot. Uh, <laughs> let the creative uh, fluids flow. But yeah, so again, takeaways... Uh, involving members uh, from the early on, if you have new people coming into the company, how do you get them on board? How do you get them involved? Uh, it's very hard to, uh, you know, first week you're working on something to feel like, oh, this is, you know, my best project ever. Uh, you need to be able to at least give a little bit of strand of hope that they can have a voice. And this goes into individual teams and people and their expertise. Uh, you need to be able to allow creative freedom. So catering to this creative industry that we are, uh, how do you develop that individualistic uh, voice uh, while still giving them enough sort of uh, confines to work in? You know, you can't have them design the whole game, of course, that might not work all the time. Uh, and, and, you know, not everybody has a clear picture of what their company culture is. That's something that even a company that, you know, 25 years on, we're still figuring out what is our culture. Uh, uh, maybe it's not as alcoholic as it used to be. Uh, we're growing up, you know, we're changing things and, and doing things differently again. But, but um, you know, you have to be able to be open to it. You can't always be resistant. Uh, that resistance is something that really ends up hurting you. Uh, and it, it doesn't really... Everything, the industry that we have is something that is made up of change. So we have to be able to open to any kind of change, at least discussing it. Uh, and, and one thing that I really try to take a lot of, uh, put a lot of effort into is to, to inspire people. You know, I have some cool ideas sometimes, and in my head they're the best thing ever. Um, and then I go talk to somebody and maybe they don't get it. Uh, but, but it's all about cultivating your ideas and being self-critical as well. But in the end, games are not ba made by yourself. You have to be able to inspire other people. And, and that is a really key thing, because when you feel inspired, that's going to show in, in the game that you're making. So really opening communication uh, and being uh, sort of open to that, fostering your innovation... You know, it's something that it looks good on paper, but then it, it's more than a, it's 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 more of a feeling than a quantifiable fact. Uh, so it's it's hard to put into words, but you need to be able to see it when it happens to you. So uh, again, these are the things that you come into, and at bigger companies, it might not work as easily, but you can try with smaller uh, teams and try to foster. Uh, that way of thinking with your group of uh, friends or your group of peers, uh, at least. And then maybe something works and you have a new tradition or a new idea that you can share with the rest of the team uh, to kind of help things uh, get along better. And then, uh, this comes to the part that we all have to do. We're all human beings. Uh, has anybody experienced any stress in, uh, in the work that they do, maybe? No? You guys are really good, okay. Because I have to say that even, even if this is a fun industry, uh, the reality is that it's not stress-free. And I think, not by a long shot. 
uh, I think it could be very, very stressful. This is your passion. You know, you live this. this the work-life balance that we have is very, very difficult to maintain. And usually, your passion for that thing you do uh, sort of overshadows the, the logic. Um, if you work at uh, another industry where you don't care about your job as much, it's easy to leave it at work. Well, this you carry with you. So uh, really it becomes a burden that you have to be able to uh, consciously uh, you know, tell yourself that here is the stress and I have to deal with it. But this also happens with your peers. And sometimes it's easier to help your peers uh, than yourself. Uh, so this is all about carrying uh, a team. You know, how do you care and carry everybody? Uh, and then hopefully if you can do that, if you can help your friends out, then maybe they can help you out as well and everybody benefits. And it sounds like a utopian San Francisco dream. But re realistically, that's what it takes. It takes you actually knowing that sometimes you need to help somebody out because that stress can be quite overwhelming. Um, work together, uh, allow for this freedom of expression, you know, allow for some outbursts, you know, understand that you are still working in a business, there has to be things done in a proper fashion, but understand that we're all humans and we want to do these things. So there's frustrations going to be there. All these things, human emotions will be a part of it. But you need to be able to approach it from the perspective that you never know what problems anybody else has. You know your problems, and on some side you might know a little bit of somebody else's, but you never know. It just expect that everybody is in a passion, creative industry, and stress, <laughs> it's universal. So that is a good way of looking at it. Uh, don't be petty. It uh, doesn't help anybody. Uh, you know, smaller kind of uh, jabs at somebody will, in the end, just make things longer. Um, and understanding that, that this is a challenge, this is a game we play. And especially the more leadership um, sort of uh, responsibilities that you have, you have to take your own ego out of it. You have to be able to say that I'm here to serve you. You are very good at doing something that I can't do, uh, so let me help you. I will get you a beer, and I will make sure that you don't feel the stress, and, and at least I can carry some of the stress. And I think this is fundamental in, in the way that you, you create a product that resonates with people, because then that innovation can shine. Then the creativity is able to be put in the game. Otherwise, I think there's a small blockage that might get in your way. Um, and this is the emotional part of the, the lecture, of course. But um, the game director of Next Machina, my dear friend, uh, Harry Kruger, uh, a creative genius. Uh, you know, he carries a lot of weight on his shoulders. But here you'll see him uh, sort of going through the end process of what we had to go through uh, with Next Machina and sort of our interaction of, of me trying to help him out a little bit as a friend. Um, and I, I, I'll try to press this play button and see if I can do it myself now. No? See? I told you. Next? Yeah. I, I'll go back to here. To the name. To the name? No, this is the... Yeah. I'll let you do it since you're, you're better at it. I know that if I don't give it my best shot, it's gonna haunt me for the rest of my days, you know? So, since I'm still physically and mentally able to push, I'll continue doing that. Oh, oh okay, okay, the luck's okay. I'll try to change it back. Okay. For the bosses, we only have two coders. Uh, of course, the second coder of those two is me. So time is running pretty short. It is coming to us June 20th, yes, which is only a month away. Um, yeah, I'm definitely hyped for this thing. Certain developers you can trust, and hey, I trust them, so I'm pre-ordering this thing. There's no reason to eat cake yet. 
but the cake was already ordered. Expecting that today was going to be the day that we get our gold submission um, into Sony. It hasn't happened yet. It's a struggle. We love to do it, but it's, it's hard. And it's insane the things some of us do just to try to bring an experience to others that they feel should be there. As a gameplay experience, it doesn't come across as this cable punk kind of nightmare that it's supposed to be. Yeah, but I mean, we've all been there to some extent, and, and, and you know, you can see that coming far away when you get into that stage of, of development. Uh, we enjoyed it a lot. Even at the very hardest moment, you're able to look at the, the future and you're saying, hey, even if the game doesn't sell, even if uh, <laughs> something happens, we pushed it out. And we were able to put our creative vision into this title. So you can still be proud of that. And in the end, you learn something. And, and you're able to keep making games. And uh, you know maybe your next game is gonna be the one that sells a lot and then you have more problems to worry about. But um, one thing that we learned, and, and hopefully this is something you can resonate with, is that you have to be able to control your crunch culture. Uh, in Finland, in general, we have a very, I would say, a, a healthy relationship with, with overwork, uh, the government, uh, laws actually forbid us from doing uh, certain things. Uh, we do have uh, overwork uh, and paid always. Uh, we have to agree to it with the workers beforehand and so on. Um, so crunch culture, uh, like the one you hear from uh, all the press, uh, is not something that we do, but we're still very uh, careful about how we do it because it does need to be done sometimes, you know, it's just the reality of the industry. And, uh, you know, uh, learn to share your responsibilities. The reason why we have multiple people working with us is that you don't have to do everything yourself. And, and sometimes, you know, if you're a perfectionist, if you're somebody who really feels like, you know, you're the only one in the world who knows how to do this thing, well, that, that is a, your opinion, you're entitled to it, but sometimes you need to be able to let go. Sometimes you need to be able to share that. And that's really a big lesson, individual lesson to learn is that the more you can share, the more you actually start trusting your friends, you know? Uh, the more you see what they can do, and the more you can then have opportunity to give creative feedback to, you know? You can actually have that conversation. If you hold on to all the stuff yourself, you're not really letting an opportunity for other people to show you what they can do. And, and spend time with everybody. You know that there's your friends you want to hang out with, and then there's the people that you, you don't know what they are, aliens or something. But you need to be able to give everybody a chance and, and to, to have some sort of a rapport. Uh, it's, it's crucial to the way a team works, that you don't uh, distance yourself, uh, uh, because that is, in the end, what makes the game, is, is the cohesion of the team, uh, and the understanding of, of all the people, uh, at least in my opinion. So, uh, I mean, this is it. This is the, the whole big deal, the speech. But what I'd like to leave you off with is that, you know, be open, uh, be, be creative, uh, enjoy uh, the process. There's no silver bullet. There's no uh, formula that this is the way you need to do this. Uh, but you need to be able to develop that on your own. You know, that's something that really is the, the challenge for everybody. Every person that uh, has their own company or starts their own company, whatever they do, you need to find the real way to do it. Uh, and, and if somebody tells you their company is perfect, then they, they don't know what the fuck they're talking about. Because that's never the reality. Uh, and it's, it should be alarming uh, to everybody. Um, but yeah, find a way that works for you. Uh, and for us... Uh, you know, we, beers was really a crucial part. I cannot stress how part it was, uh, we call it the lubricant, the social lubricant that helped us do what we do. And, uh, and then at some point we quit because it's not always good. But yeah, thank you. That's my speech.
Oh yeah, and check out the name of the game, uh, the movie. It's on uh, Vimeo, Steam, um, Amazon, iTunes. Uh, I recommend it. Okay, guys. So thank you for your talk. And if you have any questions, just raise your hand, and I'll come with Mike, and I'll ask the guys at the back to pop up uh, questions on on the screen. Any questions? No. Pedro? Easy crowd. No questions. Do we have one? Oh. So what do you think are the aspects of a huge game development success? Success. In, in, Finland. Finland. in Finland. Yeah, I mean, um, I was asked this a long time ago, and one of the answers I came up with was that because you have long winters, you stay at the office, you don't want to go outside, and you have to kind of be there, uh, and then somebody brings a bottle of whiskey. Nah. Uh, but you kind of have this sort of a family en environment where you... Uh, stay and it doesn't necessarily feel like a just a workplace but you're able to cultivate some of these relationships and and have this time um and and of course in the summertime when when it's sunny and warm uh nobody's at the office everybody's outside uh usually drinking again in the park but you have to kind of have this uh just going outside enjoying the sun getting your vitamin d for the year and then um going back to work, if you will. But um, I, I do think that the, the culture in itself is a big proponent of it. We do have some government uh, uh, subsidies to helping out the industry. Um, the Finnish, currently called the uh, Business Finland, it used to be uh, Technology and Research uh, Fund. Um, so all these things add on to it. Uh, for example, Supercell did get a lot of their early startup money from from that um, government fund. So those do help as well. But sort of maybe that persistence, that thing that can only be built by snow and ice, <laughs> that uh, really makes you go through the, the, the rocks, if you will. Can we have more questions? I'm, I'll be here all night. If you want to come say hi to me on, uh, out there as well, I'll be happy to talk there. So that was all for the talks for today, but don't leave because we are having a panel discussion about uh, self-publishing in uh, 20 minutes, I guess. So enjoy these 20 minutes and then come back.